peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. This morning we focus our attention on Jesus' words from Matthew chapter 5 where he encourages us to be salt to the earth and light to the world. You may be seated. One of the phrases that's heard oftentimes in educational and leadership circles, as well as lots of other places, I'm sure you've heard it before, is this. Don't tell me what to do. Show me how to do it. And we can probably all relate to an experience where someone has told us what it is that they want us to do, and then we go off to try and figure out how to do that thing, and we just don't have enough information to be able to accomplish the task or to be able to do what it is that we've been asked to do. But then we've also probably all had the experience, even if it was decades ago that we can remember, where someone has taken the time to show us what it is that they would like us to do, and the experience and the result is probably far different than in the first example. Because engaging multiple senses in the learning process almost always produces a better result for us. Whenever I have the opportunity, I like to ask people to show me how they've done something that they've done. Because if they show me what it is, Then, if I ever have to do that thing on my own at some point in time, I'll have the necessary information, and I'll have a better chance of actually being able to accomplish what it is that needs to be done. Show me. We even even have a state that uses that as its motto. Missouri's motto is believed to have come from an 1899 speech that was given by Willard Duncan Vandiver. How about that for a name? He was a congressman from Missouri, and he was giving a speech in Pennsylvania at the time, and he said this, he said, Frothy eloquence neither convinces nor satisfies me. I am from Missouri. You have to show me. And like Vandiver, the people who are around us need to be shown what it means to be a Christian. Now, don't get me wrong, they also need to be told, and we need to have the words to be able to say, but sometimes what we all really need is just to be shown. And first, for us to be able to do this, to show who Christ is and what he has done to others, we first need Christ to show us the way and the truth and the life, so that we are then able, by word and deed, to show all of that to others. Matthew records the words of Jesus here as he continues to speak to his disciples and probably a much larger crowd that's gathered in what we know as the Sermon on the Mount. Last week we heard the Beatitudes, which are the very beginning of this sermon, and here we hear that sermon continuing. And Jesus saying, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly, I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. What Jesus is telling here, and then showing throughout his entire life, is what the teachers of the law and the prophets never actually come to understand. They could not be saved by what they did. The law is not going to go away until that final day, and yet their insistence on keeping the law as a way and an attempt to earn merit and favor with God is not at all what the gospel teaches. Those teachers of the law spent their time interpreting and then adding to that law, which Jesus clearly teaches against. And then they try as hard as they possibly could 
to live righteously according to those laws. Both the laws that are commanded by God himself in Scripture and the ones that they've created for themselves. And then there's the Pharisees who zealously attempted to keep the law as well. And both of these groups were so proud of their own righteousness. But Jesus attempts to show them, just as he wants each one of us to understand, why attempts to keep the law are not going to lead to our salvation. Any righteousness of our own is always going to be tainted with sin. And therefore, it will always be imperfect. And it will always fall short of the perfection that God requires. Later on in chapter 4, or chapter 5 of Matthew here, Matthew records Jesus as saying these words. He tells the disciples, You therefore must be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. This is what is required. And that's difficult for us to hear because for us, perfection is impossible. And since we can't accomplish that, anyone who relies on the law for salvation is going to be sorely disappointed in the end. That's why the Pharisees, who were so zealous about their keeping of the law and establishing their own righteousness, that's why they're going to be disappointed. And that's why any one of us who attempts to keep the law is going to be disappointed. Because so often we ignore the fact that righteousness comes from God alone. And if they couldn't be saved, if those teachers of the law and those Pharisees couldn't be saved, then who can? What the scriptures plainly teach us is that no one is saved by his or her own righteousness or by keeping the law. And God doesn't want any one of us to be lost. He wants everyone to be saved. So he provides the way that salvation might be accomplished for us. It's the way that became necessary after the very first people that God created fell into sin. And he told us of that way immediately after that fall into sin, which happened so shortly after creation. And he told us about that way, but then he showed us the way in his very own Son, Jesus Christ. The one who put himself under the law so that you and all of humankind who are also under the law might be saved. Jesus, the one and only righteous one, joined all of us who are unrighteous. And he didn't erase the law. He didn't abolish the law. He fulfilled it. He kept it perfect earning a perfect righteousness that he now shares with you and with me. A righteousness that's clearly shown to be better than any that we might be able to claim for ourselves. And one that's better than any of the teachers of the law could accomplish. Better than any of the Pharisees could do on their own. Because our righteousness just won't do. It falls short. It's always going to be tainted with sin, making us unable to enter the kingdom of heaven on our own. We need God's perfect righteousness, which far surpasses that of anyone who has ever tried to keep the law. And we obtain it solely through faith in Jesus. There is no other way. And now, since God has shown us the way and the truth and the life in the person and the work of Christ Jesus, we can now rightly ask him the question, show me how to show him to others. 
As Jesus said, he didn't come to abolish the law, he came to fulfill it. Which means that we still have the law as our guide. All of you who can think back to those confirmation classes, you remember that there are three uses of the law, right? The curb, which keeps us on the right way. The mirror, which shows us our sinfulness. And then the guide, which acts as the path that God would desire for us to go on. We still have the law as our guide. Too often we think of the law as if it's something that's constricting to us, as opposed to God's law, which offers us the way to fulfill the calling that we have through our faith in Christ. It becomes a road map for us, the way by which we're able to live our lives so that we might give glory to our Father who is in heaven, which is what Jesus says is the point of our lives as salt and as light. The law plays a necessary role in God's plan of salvation. It convicts us of our imperfect obedience, showing others that self-righteousness is unreliable for entrance into the kingdom of heaven. And by practicing our faith, the law is validated. And it shows others the Christian life. And our desire is that what it shows to others would attract them to that very life for themselves. I can't tell you how many times I've heard people talk about others who are displaying their faith solely through their actions. And what I hear most often when people see that from Christians is they'll say they just know that there's something different about that person. They know that there's something in them that they don't have and they desire to have it. And that's salt. And that's light. And people want to know more. And they want to have it for themselves. They want to understand what makes us different from the rest of the world. So Jesus tells us through these words that he desires that all people would be the salt of the earth and that we would be the light of the world. But he doesn't just tell us that that's what he wants us to be. He shows us how to do it. He is the example that we can follow of opposing the corrupting power of sin in this world with good. He shows us how the goodness of God adds flavor to this world in which he's placed us and how he is the shining light shining into the darkness of our sinfulness. We know that he is the light and yet he calls us to be the light of the world. The only way that we could possibly ever do this is by allowing his light to shine through us. In mind, And in heart, we first need to thoroughly know that light in in order for us to be able to shine that light into the world. Only then, through our words and our deeds, can we be people of the light, doing Christ-like things that others may glorify God, which is the end goal of what we do as salt and light in the world that others might see that and glorify God. Think about the children in a family who are well-behaved, all of them that I'm seeing out here in our congregation today. Well-behaved children, respectful, helpful, obedient, and how that reflects the credit back on their parents. In the same way as children of God, how we are seen by the world reflects directly on our Heavenly Father. He called us out of darkness into His marvelous light. May our words and our deeds show forth the glory of His work for us in Christ Jesus, who suffered and died that we might live eternally. We are truly blessed that God not only spoke but that he also acted. He promised, 
and then he delivered. He told us, and then he showed us. We're blessed that he sent us Jesus, but also that he's called us to be salt and light in order that we might show the work of him who has done such wonderful things in our world, Christ, who has done all for us, both here and in eternity, is the light that we shine forth into this world. Hear once again the words of Jesus as recorded by Matthew and what he calls us to be and to do. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand. And it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Amen. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus.